Hi, my name is Mario Tanyas. Welcome to Getting High on Anthropology. Uh, today's guest is Kush Amor. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. So tell me a little bit about yourself. You're a musician and you have a really interesting background. You ran the Sacred Smoke Sanctuary. Correct. Uh, so tell us a bit about um, your path to get to this point. Sure, sure. I'm Kush Amor, but also Carol Andrea Morrison. That's my real name. I go by Kush Amor. Um, and I just really started uh, with my partner, the Sacred Smoke Sanctuary, which was a place for people to come and get back in touch with the sacredness of smoke. We came here from New York City at summer of 2014 and um, just really was, wanted to take advantage of the fact that cannabis was legal here and bring people back to a sense of understanding that it's a healing plant and it's a sacred plant, it's a spiritual plant. Uh, my background is Jamaican, and although my family wasn't Rastafarian, that was always in the background and this understanding that, you know, ganja is, this, is not like other plants, it's something else. So when I saw it coming legal here uh, in Denver, I just felt like I had to be a part of it and decided to open up a space which really did a lot of different things, and one of them was having a place for people to come and smoke. Excellent. I want to get into the Sacred Smoke Sanctuary, talking a bit about, um, talking more about it, but could you tell me, have you been, for a long period of time, connected to cannabis, or is this relatively new to you? I feel like I've always been connected to cannabis. It's always been a part of my family and my background, although I grew up in a Pentecostal home, so my mother particularly wasn't you know, a fan of cannabis, which... Uh, is part of what brought me here as well because she passed away in 2013 of various diseases, Alzheimer's, renal failure, diabetes, and a lot of those diseases I'm finding now that cannabis actually helps. It doesn't necessarily cure, but it treats. And I feel like if she had been into cannabis, who knows if she would be here today. So, but she wasn't into it. Uh, she did not advocate it in our household. And so when I'm finding out all of this stuff now about it being uh, medicinal and helping people, it's just been fascinating for me. I actually want to be a part of it. But no, for most of my life, I was not a smoker. I was as a teenager. I have a daughter who's now 23, and I just um, decided, you know, that the, just knowing there wasn't all this information that's out there now. So I really just stayed away from it until recently, you know, and it's become legal. And I'm like, oh, you know, I want to reemerge and get back into it and also to heal my own issues and diseases and illnesses. So I've started smoking again. Excellent. Well, we're glad that you're in Denver. <laughs> so um, the, fun being in the Denver. Sacred Smoke Sanctuary, for someone who hadn't had a chance to visit it, uh, what was it? What would people see when they would go into it? Sure. I mean, initially when you would walk in, you would just see a place of fun and games. I mean, there were games all over the place. I love playing games, board games, particularly chess was a big uh, game of ours that we'd have there. Um, and then it had, and then you'd walk in, and there would be a, an open event space for people just to do whatever they wanted to do. And we'd always have music playing, but there was many things going on in the space. It was called the Sacred Smoke Sanctuary, but we also had May's House there, which was a place for women. Um, and you know, there were various events that we'd use the space for, for that purpose. Uh, there was also the Seven Life House, which was a branch of the Native American church, getting people to get back in touch with uh, indigenous cultures. So it kind of served various purposes. And when you'd walk in, you might be like, well, I don't really understand what all of this is about. But you would love it, and you would feel comfortable there. And there was a lot to do. And um, we had people from all over the world visit. So you never know who would be there and from what part of the world. You know, China, Switzerland, like all over the world, people would come and just visit as well, because there weren't any places at the time for people to do so, and you just didn't even know what was going to be going on there. We had different things going on, fashion shows, we had, you know, goddess workshop, yoga, I mean, there was just all kinds of things happening, and it was just a place for people to smoke and express themselves and enlighten themselves, and that was what it was about. And if I got it right, the sanctuary was, it opened before the International Church of Cannabis in Denver? Yeah, it was opened, uh, well, the Sacred Smoke Sanctuary, as part of a temple, the Goddess Temple specifically, was opened in 2015. Uh, and before we became formally a temple or a church, it was opened just as a private organization where people would come and do different things, as I said before. And that we started in uh, August of 2014. So there, um, so yes, 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 we've been around for quite some time. Um, 
and the church was yeah officially opened in 2015. Okay, so. how would you deal with, because I know in my work at UC Denver, in my family, in um, other things that I do, I always deal with people who maybe aren't convinced huh. about cannabis as a research area, cannabis as a community intervention, cannabis as something that's sacred. Right. So how do you deal with some kind of criticism that people may say, oh, this woman or friends, they just want to have a place to smoke out. Right. So how do you deal with that kind of criticism if yes. you ever had to deal with it? Yes, I do have to deal with it. And I, I would say yes. I mean, I do want to just smoke out. I mean, it's fun. Like, what's wrong with having fun? I mean, so it, yes, I do want to just smoke out. But it's not only that. It also actually does heal people. And the evidence is there. Like, I, that's not, I don't even have to talk about it. Like, if you just go look it up, there's like so many, so many diseases that uh, the plant heals, unlike any other plant. It's just amazing. And it's really sad that it's been illegal for over 70 years and we haven't had access to it. And it all comes just naturally from Mother Earth. It's shocking, but it's true. And it, you know, just look at the evidence is what I would say. Excellent. But it is fun too, and it, you know, I don't want to deny that because I think we should have fun with it too. Yeah, and I think the work that you and your colleagues did, I mean, you created a space which was part of this momentum of now having in Denver emerging places where people can smoke. Yes. And so, I mean, do you see that you were sort of part of that history? Yeah, I mean, when I was here, there was, you know, there just wasn't any other places for that. There was one place um, where someone else was using their private home, but it was on a much smaller scale, and I don't think he had as much of a focus on the artists and things that we were doing or part of the spirituality in the church. But um, apart from him, there was no other place for people to actually just come and smoke as far as I knew um, in Denver proper itself. So I was very excited about that and um, has been quite shocked uh, by us having to close because I really was sure within myself that this was gonna work, you know, because there just was no other place to right. smoke. So even though it's closed, it's still just a rich repository of like cultural information mm -hmm. and experiences. So I want to ask you about some of the language that you use and what it means. Because the language right. on the website, because the website still exists. Yes. And just so people know, why don't you share the website with folks? Uh, it's www.sacredsmokesanctuary.com. Yeah, and people should definitely check it out because yes. there's a lot of um, great material on there. And so some of the language, um, you have a virtual church with um, without the church. Right. Uh, and then you have um, Venus Rising. Yes. Is that correct how yes. to say it? Yes. And so explain that for uh, sure. someone who's new to all this. Yes. Uh, I grew up in the church and I was always disturbed by the fact that all of these funds were being collected and yet there's homeless people on the street, you know, there's still police brutality, there's all kinds of horrible things going on. And I just felt like, you know, I would like to have a church where we aren't collecting funds. It's not about collecting funds. And people who work within the church are actually just really volunteering their time because they want to make a change. So, uh, but we're still a church and we're still a temple and we still work together and we're still family and we still have a common purpose, you know. So that's really what the Church of No Church is, that we are still a collective, we are still a congregation, but we don't have a physical temple and we don't collect funds and we don't have a physical temple because the whole earth is sacred and the whole earth is our temple and we can have our homes our temple. Like, why does it have to be in this one place that isn't even housing, you know, so many people who need places to live? So that was um, where that inspiration came from for me. And then Venus Rising, uh, is really just about the goddess of love and wisdom and um, I just feel like there isn't enough of an emphasis on the fact that God, at least as far as I'm concerned, is both male and female and we just focus on the male aspect uh, and I wanted to get forth that God is a female and cannabis as a plant has often been used to represent the goddess. Um, and it was sad to me that that wasn't expressed enough to me in the industry or just otherwise. I'm like, you know, this is, we smoke a female plan and it's all about the goddess. And I just, for me at least, and I wanted to bring that knowledge forward. So that's what Venus Rising is to me. That's great. I mean, what I appreciate about the text and what you just said, it seems like you have some training in like critical feminist studies because <laughs> there is that kind of bent to it in a, in a positive way. We know the sector, and I've talked to a lot of people, you know, they argue it's sort of, you know, trust fund guys, frat boys, mm -hmm. not many people of color. You know, in, right. in Colorado, there's one or two, you know, African Americans that own, um, you know, businesses. And so are you influenced by some kind of feminist thinking? And, and so I would say I am, which is my partner, Kat. Um, she, she really brought me forward in terms of the feminist thinking. I've always been a spiritual person, not necessarily a religious person. I, 
you know, I've always kind of questioned what was taught to me as a, in the Christian world, but I've always loved it and understood it, and I just felt like there wasn't, the truth wasn't coming out. So that was really um, my focus, and I, through her influence, I became more uh, enthralled with this, the goddess and understanding who the goddess was. Uh, and, and incorporating that into everything that I do. That's great. No, I really appreciate the text. Um, another term that was interesting for me as an anthropologist, um, musin. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so unpack for that for me. With the, first spell it for people. Sure, M-U-Z-E-N. Uh, a large part of, of the Venus Rising as well was just having fun, and that's always what I've said. It's about having fun, and who's, who's more fun than the muses? You know, so that's, and creating, being creative. So... Uh, it's really a play on the muses, but we're meditating muses. We're also about the Zen. I love to meditate. I feel that that's the way to reach our own divinity individually. Uh, we all have God within us, and it's just a matter of silencing the external voices. Mm -hmm. So we spend a lot of time meditating, and that's, that's what it is. We're having fun, and we're meditating muses. That's what a musen is. <laughs> so tell me about... Um, uh, maybe one representative conversation that you've had with someone who's interested in the sanctuary mm -hmm. and how would you talk to them to just kind of spell it out for them and maybe get them to become a member and how did that process work? Sure, um, a lot of times it's people who, who smoke cannabis uh, are the creatives and they really uh, understand that they owe a lot to the plan. You know, they love the plan and they owe a lot to the plan and they feel like it's not just about making money and uh, this whole commercialization that's going forward. So I would just talk to them about that. Do you smoke? How do you feel about smoking? Does it help you? Um, and that's part of what I'm doing with, with this new show, Sacred Smoke Sanctuary uh, at Denver Open Media. It's just going to be people talking about the plan and what it's done for them, how it's healed them physically, how it's healed them spiritually, how it's helped them to be elevated, advanced. And... Um, you know, we talk about that and we talk about the goddess. The goddess is uh, more controversial. <laughs> Not everybody's um, willing to accept that God is both female and male. I mean, that's, that's and I'm surprised. It's that, radical. It, it's radical. And I'm like, really? Like, we all come from a woman, but people find it really radical. So um, I'm finding right now it's mainly women, women who are interested in joining, surprisingly. But I, I, but I was pleasantly surprised by the amount of men who were, who were interested in supporting us and being at the space because um, they do recognize, a lot of men do recognize the creatrix and yeah. that energy. I wrote music and poems as a young teenager and then for most of my life I didn't. I practiced law, which is like the opposite I feel sometimes of creativity, but you have to be creative in law too. But it <laughs> wasn't quite the same. Um, and I felt like through smoking cannabis, it opened up a whole new world of creativity for me um, and we're really about getting back to all of the indigenous plants of the earth but cannabis is my sacrament i don't worship cannabis but i do honor cannabis um, as representing the goddess uh, and yeah it's really increased my creativity and I've, I've started making music to a large extent remaking music to a large extent under the influence of cannabis, and I think it's a blessing, and I, you know, think it's what I'm supposed to be doing. So, so let me ask work. you about your music. Um, yes. You have a few things going on. You have um, uh, a couple videos. Mm -hmm. um, you have also next week, which is um, the first week of October, or in two weeks, you're right. going to be performing here at Denver Open Media. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your music. How do you like? What's the genre or subgenre? It's and different. I call it um, I call it reggae dance rock, um, kind of com combining my background being. Jamaican, but also Canadian. I was born and raised in Canada, so I grew up with a lot of rock music. Um, and then I just like soca music too, which is this you know, Caribbean dance music. So it's really just about having fun and dancing and, and having a good time. And I've made it using my iPhone. I'm not traditionally trained as a musician, although I do play the drums, hand drums, and I'm getting to learn the bass. But uh, it's really just been through my iPhone that I've put together beats, and I've been amazed at how well that's worked. Uh, and the lyrics and, and, and everything else just comes from within me, um, and I just make the music. It's really about, again, the goddess. Uh, I try to always incorporate my overall message uh, to people and, and in the words and the sound, and I love it. It's That's fun. cool. Do you want yes. to tell us about one of your songs that you're drawn to and what message you want people to get out of it? I would say Queen City, which is, which is the one that's been released. Uh, is about my 
partner and I having a bit of a difference of opinion after uh, we ended up losing the space. Um, she really loved Denver and wanted to be here. And I could understand why the elevation, I feel, is a big part of it. And I do feel like the people out here tend to be very spiritual, talking a lot more so than in New York City, which is where I just came from before coming to Denver. Um, but it was really the story of like my experiences here and just joining the cannabis industry, although I wasn't really in the industry, you know, but just being more involved with cannabis and losing everything. Like I lost everything, like everything. So you got a clean slate. I started, yes, now I'm at a clean slate. That's definitely true. But I lost everything and went back to New York to kind of try to recuperate. And it just felt really good being back home and hanging out. And, you know, I just, that was really the inspiration for the song was just being here and there. But it's also uh, a song about the goddess as well and the different goddesses that I mentioned. And some people don't even realize, uh, quite a few people have told me that, like, I didn't even know you were talking about the goddess. I didn't even know who it is that you're talking about. And I feel like, that makes me really excited because at least I'm bringing forth, you know, people looking it up. People are looking it up now. A few people who've listened to it, not a bunch of people whoever's listened to it, are trying to figure out who are these gods, you know, and I think that that's really great. So, and I do have a video that was made by a dear friend of mine who's a pretty well known artist out in New York, Michelle Sutherland. Denver, the queen city, she's a mile high. Denver is her city, she's a mile high. She lives on her mountain top where all the gods drop. She lives on her mountain top where all the gods drop. Shiva Umani, Thaya Athena.
adding to the list, you're going to be a producer at Denver Open Media. And uh, right, I'm a producer at Denver Open Media. So tell me about my, that. What's your show? Uh, what would people uh, watch? And what do you, like kind of guess? Like, can you explain it a little? Well, I'm going to start out as a radio show, and what I've been doing is just taping people uh, going around Denver, talking to them about what cannabis essentially means to them, how it's helped them. Um, I'm going to have my own commentary on there as well, and just play really great beats and music and you know just be just be fun and have fun and it's usually in places where people are having fun so it's all about having fun and also educating at the same time i just wanted to have a forum for people to to hear about the goodness of ganja the goodness of ganja and so when's the launch date uh, I, I think I have to. I have not sure as yet. I'm still like getting through some more details on it, but I will have a date soon, and I'll definitely announce it on the Sacred Smoke Sanctuary. It's going to be aired there as well. So, what um, recommendation would you have for an undergrad student or a graduate mm -hmm. student that that wants to get involved with some of this stuff, either along research lines, mm -hmm. like a particular area you think is under researched, or even to engage at the community level? Right. So, I don't know if you had one particular area that you think, oh, this would be a nice project for someone to think about. Uh, yeah, I feel like there isn't enough being done with respect to just uh, healing, the healing aspects of cannabis. Uh, and there's so many illnesses out there. My mother passed away of Alzheimer's, and I feel like my memory is going each and every day. And I'm like, I would just love more research on Alzheimer's and its effect on cannabis. And there's some stuff out there, but there's just so much more research that needs to be done. It's all so new because we've been under prohibition for the last 70 years, and it's like now you know, everything just needs to be ex explored. Um, so I would say really just getting into healing, getting actual uh, experiments done with real people who smoke as opposed to just reading what's being said is important. Because um, there's just been so much discrimination against the plant and people who use it that you really just have to be real and actually interview and, and observe people who actually use it. No, these are great ideas and definitely they're under research and of course one of the problems with Schedule 1 status, yeah. not being able to access, you know, the, the leaf, the flower. Right, and, right. And, um, so maybe we'll see changes in the future that can allow people to do, you know, really good evidence-based research about the healing yeah. therapeutic properties. It's in a, the plant is just in such a strange um, situation currently, you know. It's legal in some parts of the country and not in others, and you still have people getting locked up for using it, and in other places people are making millions of dollars from using it. It's, it's extremely disturbing. Yeah. Um, the commodification of cannabis yes. and the greed that's associated the greed with that's, it. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and, and, and the enforcement, like even here in Denver, I mean, we ended up getting raided by the police uh, as well, uh, you know, which was, which was shocking for me and totally changed my entire view of the legal system and the justice system. I mean, we weren't selling cannabis. We've been following the laws. Uh, even though we're allowed to sell cannabis as part of our church legally, uh, the police came, they raided us, they had no warrant. Oh my um, God. What time of day was it? Did it was in the night. We were in bed. My partner and I were in bed, half, you know, half unclothed, and just these police officers, five of them just like with lights in our oh spaces in the middle of the night. Um, and we were just like, what's going on? You know, and they wouldn't tell us. And they handcuffed us. They had bruises on our hands. They pulled us out of the house. And then eventually they were like, you know, oh, we thought you were selling cannabis here. I'm like, you know, is that a reason to just, you know, violate our constitutional rights? Like what happened to no illegal search and seizure? Or it was, it's very disturbing. I'm still actually looking for an attorney who specializes in that to see what we can do. I mean, I can do what I can do, but that's not really my area of expertise. Um, was that um, episode part of what was created the downfall? Or the yeah, I feel so. I mean, I just became, um, very disheartened by it because I, you know, I'm a Columbia Law School grad and I've been practicing law for over 20 years and I'm just, it shocked me. It shocked me because I was like, if this could happen to me, it can happen to anybody, you know? And I just felt like a, you know, a Negro lesbian woman and it's like, I had no rights. Uh, yeah, no one should have to go through <laughs> I had through no that. rights. No one should, but it happens every day and we allow it to happen. Yeah, it's, no, it's, not it's, really, cool. it's really unfortunate. I've heard of people up in different parts of the states where they'll get pulled over with a little weed in a pipe and the charges get trumped up to distribution. They can say anything. Yeah, it's, They can it's, literally say anything and, and we're just totally at their whim. It's crazy at yeah, this point. Yeah, so it's, um, it's a bit uh, disheartening, as yes. you kind of said. Um, let me ask you about your Jamaican background because you mentioned, yes. you know, we're here in the U.S., you have this Canadian background, you have this Jamaican background. 
you recently went to Jamaica. Right. And so how did that, like, how did you enjoy it? Does that, does that background influence your music and your... your... Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I felt like I had to just go back and reconnect with my roots, so I spent some time out there just traveling all over the island. Uh, and they had recently decriminalized as well, and it was interesting to me see, seeing their approach as opposed to the Denver, Colorado approach. Because out there, people just grow it naturally. It's just grown from the ground. You pick it, you dry it a little bit, and you smoke it. And people smoke all day, like all day. And it's cool. And you just, you know, you can get a whole bag for like $5. It's crazy. <laughs> like, it's a totally different model, but it feels like a more natural model. And the way I feel it probably should be. Like, why do we need all of these regulations and... You know. or, or just, you know, forcing the plants indoors. I, indoors I, is other I mean, is the crazy thing. That's not naturally where it's supposed to yeah, be. Yeah, I, I understand. I think the, the reasoning was that it allows the legislators and policymakers more control. I but it's so. definitely sort of contradictory to sort of the essence of the plant. Yeah, yeah. And we already know it heals just as it is. So why do we have to do all of these extra things to it? I don't get it. And so would you be disheartened if many people go on these trips to Jamaica to get to know cannabis? Or are you... Would you prefer people maybe stay in Denver and just do their tour? Because I hear <laughs> like Jamaica being sort of oversaturated with, you know, you know, white Rastas that want to go check out. Right. I mean, yeah, I mean, and that's been part of, you know, kind of what the Sacred Smoke Sanctuary is about for me is this cultural appropriation or misappropriation. Um, you know, because for the Rastafarians that I know, they take the plant very seriously and it really is the healing of the nations and it's disturbing to see people using it just to make money, you know, and, and commercialize the plan. And it's like, are you giving anything to Jamaica? Like, are you saying anything about spiritual? No, you know, it's just, let's, let's put up this picture of Bob Marley. And so it's just, you know, it's disturbing. But I love people going to Jamaica and checking it. It's a beautiful, beautiful yeah. island, you know. And I just don't like um, that it's not being respected a lot, you know. And, that, and particularly thinking that there are people, particularly Rastafarians, who are still in jail you know, why? Like, why is that happening? It just doesn't make any sense. I'm going to be performing, performing here, Denver Open Media, on first Friday. I, I haven't set an exact time as yet, and I'll have to announce it, um, but I am going to be at Denver Art Society, which is just right across the street at 9 o'clock. So I'm going to be doing both places. I'm going to be playing music from my new album, which is called Hail, Seven Carols, uh, as well as Queen City. And I'm going to also be playing some uh, cover, cover hits, reggae mainly. I mean, that's, that's really my focus, kind of getting back that vibe. Right. Well, I think we're out of time. So, Kush, thank you so much. Sure. I, I really enjoyed talking with you. Uh, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. I'm Marty Otanya. This is Getting High on Anthropology. You can find us at fs, fsandgreen.org. Let me say that one more time, fsandgreen.org. Uh, have a great night. Thanks for tuning in.